I'll start down at the end over there. We have Pete Schulman, who is our Chief Talent Officer. We have Dr. Barry Erlickson, who is our Chief Performance Officer. And we have Dr. Penny McCormick, who is our Chief Academic Officer. And what we ask them to do is share with you this morning, briefly introduce themselves, to share with you their initiatives in their uh, different departments, and, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions and discussion, which I'll moderate following their presentation. So I think we'll start with Penny. Bad on this particular thing. 
This was simply a red carpet to professional development that was some of the best that we ever offered. So it's really important to kind of recognize that this is what has put me down this path of, you know, I think standards are important. I think curriculum is important as a foundation. It's certainly not the end of our challenge. Okay? As a principal, though, I thought, gosh, you know, the, the teachers in my school can determine what students need to know and be able to do using these standards, but these are the same standards being used by the entire district. And wouldn't it be grand if the district would put out some basics around what kids needed to know and be able to do and some common assessments? And then we could really get to the challenge of engaging lessons and engaging teaching techniques to get to those things in our school. And that's when I went to the district level and developed some, some curriculum to do that and got that out to our schools. And I didn't mean anyone followed the script, but it did mean they had some clarity about what students needed to know at a given grade level and how it would be assessed. That's really big. I'm going to talk about assessment kind of a lot today um, because I, I, I think it's important to recognize that one of the strongest strategies for improving student achievement, student, improving student learning, is exactly what Doug said, which is feedback. Feedback to our children, just like we're talking about feedback to teachers, just like we're talking about feedback to principals. Quality feedback improves student learning. Not necessarily needing to put a grade in the book because you gave an assessment, but rather helping kids understand that this is how they're doing on each learning objective really does help them move along. So at the state level, I have some of the same concerns, and my concerns are bigger because I think we do have something happening in our country right now that is unique. And I think it does matter that we've got a common set of standards that 46 states in D.C. have agreed on. It's powerful. A lot of very intelligent, smart, thoughtful people did sit together and agree on these standards, and I think that makes them more important. They are fewer, clearer, and more rigorous. I'm going to give you some quick examples. The fewer matters. I know that um, at one point, uh, Doug Reeves had some work out about making standards work, and we needed to prioritize standards because there were too many to teach. These are fewer in a purposeful way because there were too many to teach, and we wanted to be clear about what students could learn in a given year's time. In addition, just, just to get this out as well, I do understand that students come more challenged to us. And I'm remembering some of, of Doug's studies, the 90-90-90 studies, that said, you know what? There are schools with 90% poverty who are also achieving at 90% proficient and above. And those schools do things differently. They don't redefine the standards for the kids. They do use time differently. They do teach differently. They do have to look at assessing student progress more carefully so that they know exactly and can target the assistance that those children need over time. So I think those are things that are very important to re remember. Also, the Common Core, core State Standards are internationally benchmarked. I think it's important. You know what? We're not going to be Finland. I don't even want to be Finland. But if Finland is doing something that looks like it's working, would I want to learn about what they might be doing? Yes, I would. I'm not comfortable being number 19 or 26. As, as a country. I think we can do better, and it doesn't hurt to learn from others. I was reminded the other day that our college system, we stole that from Scotland. It's a system that's known worldwide as the best. I think we stole an idea and we made it better as Americans. I think we can do the same with some of what we can learn from these other countries. And I think the Common Core has taken advantage of that. With the Common Core comes 45 other states in D.C. that I can look at. Because I, I, I didn't share this to begin with, but my job description is to implement the Common Core statewide in every school and every classroom. Feel free to laugh a little bit. That's an interesting job. But I do think the state has an has a interesting place here, okay? Because I think it's difficult. I've been at the district level a lot. I've been at the school level quite a bit. It's difficult for you to see, well, what, what's New York doing? What's Rhode Island doing? What's Massachusetts doing? And I think that is a state job, to make sure I do know what they're doing. Because at this point, we are all utilizing these same standards. And so I want to do those things, and I want to report back to you in a way that you find engaging. Okay? And, and as, I, as I talk about the model curriculum that the state's going to put out, 
that's something that's quite important, and, and I think, let me get to that right now. Oh, actually, let me get to just giving a couple of examples of Common Core. You know, one of the things I think is missing in, um, in some of our conversations are the examples. You know, we're, we're educators. We like examples. And, and when I look at these two sets of standards here, I can see that the Common Core would help a teacher better understand what kids need to know and be able to do with regards to informational materials here. This New Jersey standard is not a bad standard. It says produce written work and oral work that demonstrates comp comprehension of informational materials. But if you really think about it, there's a whole host of things along a continuum of rigor a teacher could do to get to this standard. And if you look at the next, determine two or more central ideas in a text, analyze the development over the course of the text, provide an objective summary, it's clearer. And it is more rigorous because of that clarity. And I do think in a system where children move from K through 12, and we intend to get them ready for college and career, we must define what needs to be learned at each level. Without that, I'm not sure how we could assure our students that they will be ready for what life, life's challenges are ahead for them. I'm not going to go through all of them. This is a, a map one on the Pythagorean theorem. You can see. In New Jersey, we're saying understand and apply. Common Core just gets that little bit more specific. The other thing that's beautiful about <coughs> Common Core, and if you haven't read the Common Core State Standards, I urge you to print them out and put them by your bedside table. I think they'll keep you up. Um, but a really cool thing is I was able to lay them all out, K-12, and kind of look at the progression. A really cool thing is how specific the progression is. When you're working with teachers, make sure they're looking at what the grade before and the grade after is doing because it's well defined. I mean, here you see in grade three, they're comparing and contrasting two <coughs> important details in two texts. In grade four, they're integrating them to talk about them or write about them knowledgeably. And in grade five, several texts. So teachers have some definition there that I think is really, really helpful. Um, I'm not going to read through this one, but the deck will be available to you. I do think if you read the grade 11 and 12 standards, and I can tell you that post-secondary has, you can see college readiness there. You can read that and understand if students can do these things, then they will be college ready. And what's beautiful is you can follow this back to kindergarten and see what would they be doing in kindergarten that would get them here. And that is something that makes these standards unique. I'm not going to go through the three shifts today. But I do want to talk a little bit about how the state intends to assist with Common Core implementation. We're doing something that's very different, and that very different is rather than putting the standards out there and, and helping you develop curriculum in our 600 districts, we're going to put a model out there because that's good teaching and learning. When, when you give a class an assignment that's difficult and challenging, and the Common Core state standards are different and challenging, it's important to put an example out. And so that's what we're going to do. We are not going to mandate this model of curriculum in your districts. Now, if you've heard me talk before, you know why. Okay, we're not going to mandate it because then we would just fight today about what I was telling you to do and how that wouldn't be appropriate for you to do. This is a model. It's an exemplar. It's meant to inform. People shouldn't stop writing curriculum. They should just know that the state will be looking at the standards, putting them into six-week units, Deconstructing them into student learning objectives, making them more specific so teachers understand what students need to know and be able to do, and include formative assessments. Those six-week formative assessments would allow your teachers to do what you hope to do for your teachers, create a learning system, give students feedback to help them improve. Those six-week assessments would be graded by student learning objectives. A student at the end of that assessment shouldn't say something like, I got a B plus. They should say something like, I should demonstrate proficiency. I know SLO 1, 2, and 3. I still need to work on 4 and 5. That's the difference. That can allow for differentiation that we talk about a lot, but we don't talk about how you can specifically do it. So the state intends to put this out as a model to assist your teachers. In addition, 2.0. 2.0 will include model lessons. Now I think about new teachers and struggling teachers. 
And I think about those teachers being able to not only look at a six-week unit, but to look at a videotape of a master teacher teaching those SLOs. And I think about how powerful and helpful that would be to you and to the teacher. If I was a principal and I had this available to me and I knew I had a struggling teacher, I would look at these videos and say, I, I want you to watch this one. This one is in your content area, which makes it more powerful, and it's getting at some of the instructional strategies we've been talking about. Teachers being able to see that really can help them improve. In addition, we want to have an item bank for each unit so teachers can design their own formative assessments without necessarily designing every item. Item writing, by the way, is a bit of a science and an art, and most teachers haven't been trained in it. So if we can have a bank of items that are well-developed, that a teacher can choose from taking his or her classroom into account, I think we've got a system there. We call it the instructional improvement system. You, if, if you've read the race to the top, you would see that. I think a system like that can really assist our teachers in better using formative assessment to improve student achievement. In content that teachers may not remember or know before they teach a unit that would be helpful. And the hardest thing for a teacher to say is that I don't know content, my content area. But if they can click on a video that's in a unit by themselves, in their home, I think they're going to do it. And I think that that can really allow for the kind of improvement that we're looking for. It doesn't mean all professional development gets, gets delivered that way, of course not. But I can tell you this. The professional development where we bring a group together and we talk to them or at them for a couple of hours and send them off and never see them again is something that we have to stop. It, that simply isn't using teacher time effectively at all. And we know that. If we don't bring them back together to say what worked and what didn't, then we simply will not move forward. The model curriculum has the same sort of approach. We'll be releasing unit one SLOs, K-12, math and ELA over the next few weeks, math by next Wednesday. You'll be able to click on a button on our website to model curriculum, look at Unit 1, let your teachers who might be writing curriculum right now look at Unit 1 SLOs, and there's a survey of questions asking, are these clear enough? Are they aligned to the standards enough? Can you understand these in a way that you feel comfortable teaching them? And are there two principal feedback on those things. Just really quickly, because I know I've, I'm probably going over my time a little bit, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop. Um, I, I want to talk about common assessments, and I want to talk about implementation a little bit. There's some, there's some research out there, I don't know if you saw it, that said standards alone will not improve student achievement. Yes. I'm the academic one, I'm in charge of implementing the Common Core State Standards, and by themselves, even if I write the best model curriculum you ever did see, it will do nothing. Okay? In addition, we've signed on to the Park Assessment Consortium. 23 states and us will be utilizing that assessment. Okay? That alone, along with standards, will not improve its student achievement. We already know that. We've done 10 years of that. Okay? It's the implementation of aligned curriculum. Implementation meaning that you are in the classrooms checking to see. Not only is the teacher teaching to a learning objective, but is that learning objective aligned to the standards that they need to teach to? Okay? And without that check and getting better and better at that, yes, standards alone and assessments alone will not raise student achievement. I just want to, I, I, and, and what I'd like to talk about just a little bit is the idea that numerous, numerous initiatives are, are the problem, okay? Our work is not simple work. Just focus on one thing. But I would ask us to think about focusing on what students need to know and be able to do, how we can best determine whether or not they're learning, how we can have Teachers come together to look at who might utilize that and the time that we I do think if we focus on those four things, or I could say five because I have data in there too, we will move the needle on student achievement in ways that we simply haven't before. We have not paid attention to the effectiveness of the instruction and the instruction alignment to standards 
that we, that we should have been and that we could have and that I believe can move the needle. I just want to share real quickly the park assessment system, just to be clear, does include a beginning of the year assessment, a diagnostic assessment, a mid-year assessment, and then goes into a summative assessments that include performance-based <coughs> activities as well as your more classic multiple choice computer scored systems. Okay, it's a different assessment. We have a different set of standards and we have a different assessment that I think that we need to be able to come together about and get ready for and embrace. Okay, because this set of assessments and that set of standards that I've been talking about are fewer, clearer, more rigorous, and, and I would argue that between this performance-based assessment and the other assessment, that these are assessments that are appropriate to teach towards. Now, our students had to read two nonfiction articles, take a point of view in writing, and support it from the text. I didn't mind teaching to that any day that I was a teacher. I didn't mind asking teachers to teach to that, because I know that's what I did every day at the college level. And I was preparing students for college and career success if I did indeed teach those tests. So I think what we need to ask about assessments is, what does that assessment look like? Before we simply fall into the rhetoric of, it's just bad to teach the tests. Because again, I just, and before I end, want to remind you that the number one strategy for improving effectiveness is feedback. And feedback comes after you give an assessment. But you help that student and that teacher and that principal understand that that assessment is meant to help them. Help them gain clarity around what, what they need to do or what they still need to learn and what, what they have learned. So I'm going to stop now, even though I've got a huge deck here, um, and, and go on and, and give the mic to Barry. Thank you. My name is Barry Ehrlichson. I am so pleased to be here this morning. I, it's been so hard for me to sit still. Those of you who know me are probably actually just immediately impressed that I've been sitting still because um, I am just so um, so excited and, and raring to go. There's, I could spend all of my time just engaging Dr. Reeves' comments um, around accountability and performance. There's just so much to echo in, in his work and in what he had to say this morning. And it's so validating in so many ways uh, to what the department is pursuing and has articulated in its waiver, um, or its NCLB waiver. Um, so I'm just going to sort of put this, I'm going to put this in context first, but I want to make sure that I have an opportunity to introduce myself. I I'm just thrilled to be back at NJPSA. This is probably, I don't know, my fourth time standing at this podium in the last seven months. They're, they've always been such a great host to me. My team's been here as well, working with principals and supervisors in particular around our growth methodology. Um, and I just want to make sure that I say today that if you currently have access to student records, like if you're, the, if you're in a position in your role in the building where you could walk in and get a student file from the secretary, like that's an appropriate act of yours, you need to have an NJ Smart login. And, and that you need to do that like Monday. All right, because I'm just, oh, I'm not going to make anybody raise their hands. I don't want to embarrass us all about who doesn't have an NJ Smart login, but you need one. Um, it's time. It, it, we have moved in the last two years away from a system where we just submit data, and then I use it to submit data to the feds, to something that is giving back to you. And I'm going to show you a little bit of that today, but please, by all means, the person in your district is the web user administrator. It's typically a VA. They're the person that NJ Smart takes direction from. You are the stewards of this data under the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. So we follow your lead. We won't give a login to NJ Smart unless your WUA, I love that, your WUA tells us that you have the appropriate access. All right, so let's start. Um, much, of our, much of my particular direction in what I'm doing was dictated by our participation in the Stimulus Act. So back in 2009, superintendents across the state signed for assurances for the State Fiscal Stabilization Fund, SFSA. I worked for six months to be able to put those initials in the right order for you. I, I, I grew up with a speech problem. I'm a proud graduate of speech therapy, and I could not actually have done that when I was eight. Okay, so one of the first ones is what Penny's talking about, the adopting of standards and assessments that are of preparing students for college and career readiness. Um, the second is the recruiting, the development, and the retaining of effective teachers and principals. 
The third is turning around the lowest performing schools. And the fourth, and this is what I'm going to spend my, most of my time talking about, which is building the data systems that are able to inform instruction and inform school improvement. So, it is unbelievably frustrating. Yet, even yesterday during the budget hearings, I heard um, somebody say, so when is the system going to be ready? Right? Okay. NJ Smart has been up and running for five years. Okay? We have taken student level data. We started piloting in 06, 07, but we finished assigning student level IDs to every active student in the state in the fall of 2007. Okay? The system is there. It's up and running. Part of the trouble that we have is going back to the notion, actually it's not just the notion, it's the incredible responsibility that we have to protect our students' confidentiality. So the general public probably doesn't know that NJ Smart is there and that it's up and that it's running. And part of it is by design. We limit access to people who have the appropriate role to see student level data. But this is what we're going after in terms of our in terms of our development under SFSA. Student growth. It's very important for you to know that our student growth methodology is not value-added methodology. Okay? BAM methodology is an incredibly complex, very different mathematical me method of determining student growth. It's based on prediction and student growth methodology, which is SGP. Uh, also known as the Colorado Growth Methodology, is not a predictive model in the same way that a value-added methodology is. Okay, so we, BAMs work in a lot of places well. It was not an appropriate fit given the structure of our assessments. For us, at this point, we chose SGP. About 10 other states are formal adopters at this point of SGP, and about 12 states are, are online coming on board with adopting SGP for student growth. On the website, on, NJ, on the NJ Smart section of our website, we've developed a 13-minute video that really is appropriate for everyone to watch about how and the methodology works. I toured the state between November and January and spoke to every county-level curriculum coordinator meeting, and I showed the video in every presentation. So the superintendents are seeing it, because I'm talking to the roundtables right now, and the curriculum coordinators have seen it, and I really urge you to use it, to look at it, to see it in, in your context. <coughs> Growth is such an important concept for us. We've been wanting to do it for a long time. We needed to have stability in our testing programs in order to be able to talk about trajectory from one to the next, but we've been piloting it in the department since about 2009. So, oh, by the way, I should say, I've, I've Hi, I'm Barry. Um, I've been in the state of New Jersey since 1997. I was once a professor at Rutgers. There's at least one person in this room who's a former student of mine. Um, we won't talk about who he is, but there he is. Um, and I left Rutgers after, after spending some time there. My, my field of research there was out of implementation. And I went, I did everything a little bit backwards. I went and got a post back from Montclair State, a student taught in Newark. And then I had a classroom of my own in Plainfield before I went to the department. And by the way, I spent a great deal of time when I was at Rutgers criticizing the department. Um, and some of those folks are now exactly the people that I work with on a daily basis. And so you always have to be a little bit careful about what you say. All right, so the next piece of what we're doing with NJ Smart is the graduation rate, um, being able to calculate graduation in the NCLB four year adjusted cohort graduation methodology. Um, that's a big step forward for us. There's going to be a difference in that number when we present it publicly, just so that you're aware. The other, the, the next piece of this is the connection to post-secondary data. Um, most of you know that nearly half of our students who graduate from high school leave the state for post-secondary education. Um, we are now contracting with the National Student Clearinghouse to get that data at a student level. So there will be a high school feedback report in, the, in, in JSMART where you can look at your high school graduates and see where they went to college. Track their progress in college so that ultimately you know of the students I educated, who were they that went and finished college in four years and five years? What were their what were what their majors? Imagine a world where you know, and I just get goose pimples, where you know who took your AP biology class, 
who, what their scores were on the AP biology test, and whether or not they went on to a biology major in college, right? And even more importantly, whether or not your interventions and your mentoring around women in science and technology fields, whether or not that seemed to have paid off in the careers that they chose. Being able to combine state data with local data is one of the greatest challenges, and we're trying to make it easier and easier for you. And then finally, the, one, of, one of the things that I've been spending a great deal of time talking to, obviously, the curriculum coordinators about, but around the rest of the state, is the course and section data. It is about creating a student-teacher link inside NJ Smart, and ultimately being able to fulfill the uh, SF, SF requirement of creating a teacher impact using student growth methodology. So that is coming on this summer, and we have been out there, we've been training and training and training um, curriculum coordinators to be able to undertake some of that work, and also your NJ Smart points of contact. We will be collecting that data for the first time this, this summer. We are also incredibly proud about our professional development series inside NJ Smart. Um, like I said, the team's been here tra training, but we also have, last year we did over 270 various WebExes around using NJ Smart. One of them is talking about how high quality data, how we do this inside schools and districts. Um, garbage in, garbage out, right? I know, I, 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 I sympathize a great deal with the states that are having troubles you know, assigning value added to the PE teacher, right? Because ultimately that data starts and originates inside school districts before it gets to the state. So there's no possible way for me to be able to discern whether or not you've done that work well. And so I know it'll be a headline that we've given the PE teacher a math about a math SGP score. Okay, and I'm I'm really I'm I'm working hard to help folks think through that. But it's ultimately something where LEAs have to step up and take some responsibility around their data quality. The second is using district reports, which is our one-click functionality. Who's in your building? Um, ultimately, click here, get a list of the students who um, have been partially proficient for the last two years. Right? If you've got someone in your building typing student achievement data from the tests into a system, they should stop that immediately. It's downloadable. We load it for you. It's downloadable. Um, back to measuring what matters. One of the most in, in compelling pieces of research that I've seen is out of the Annie Casey Foundation's funding of attendance counts. Right now, one-click functionality, find out the kids who are chronically absent. The students who miss 10% of kindergarten and 10% of school, that's three days before October 15th, the first grade, they are finding with incredible level of correlation are the dropouts to 8th grade. Okay, talk about a leading indicator. That, that, that really, talk about a leading indicator. I know when I taught, for the limited amount of time, I don't want to make it sound like I was there forever, but for the limited amount of time, I know I was really good at the kid who was absent three days in a row. Right, I was all over that child to catch them up, but the kid who missed one day every other week, that was hard for me. Like I, I, that was hard for me to keep it, and I'm one of the most data-driven people you'll meet, right? And, but yet, one day every other week is a chronically absent child. And it may not be that they've lost the material, but they've lost the connection to the building in and of itself. All right, so then um, we using Ed Analyzer, which is an ad hoc business intelligence tool. You guys can drop the variables in that you're interested in, run the reports that you like. <coughs> Using student growth percentiles, that, that's been a major focus this year for us. We've been out on the road doing a lot of that. And then finally, using data to improve school and district performance. Okay, in a world where words are important, I just want to talk about my title for a moment. A lot of people in my position across the country have the title Chief Accountability Officer. That's not my title, I'm the Chief Performance Officer. It's a, it's a subtle thing. But in a world where you look at Michael Fullen and you talk about accountability, and you've been listening to this morning to Dr. Reeves, accountability in and of itself is not the, is a wrong driver, right? We know that we need to be looking at things that we can't measure well. We know that you need to be looking at things that only you can measure, right? Performance needs to be larger 
than accountability. And if you look at the waiver, that's the way we've conceived all of our work going forward with, the, with schools. Under MCLV, friends, in October, we identified 1,200 schools as failing. Okay? It's like more than half of the Title I schools were declared failing under the AYP targets. In our waiver, we're talking about working with about 250 of those schools now. The other 1,000, right, it's time for performance management. And my role at the department is to give out enough data to help local folks look at themselves, evaluate themselves next to peers, next to the state, set local goals, plan locally, and hold themselves accountable for their work. The theory in the waiver is so powerful, it is no longer about the state department holding all of the accountability in, this, in the system. It is about giving folks the kind of information and support that they need to manage it in themselves and talk about things that are important. Success can look very differently across the state and in every different building. Goals should be unique to the buildings and unique to the context. All right, so um, my last slide, I think I have one more. Oh, this is the tease. This is the tease. This is a screenshot. When it doesn't have real data in it because I didn't want to bring real data. But this is a screenshot of a one-click report inside NJ Smart that's available right now. It's our graduation report, right? You can run this for the 2013 <coughs> class. Who's on track? Now, at this point, it's a pretty rough measure. It's about the kids that you've promoted from one grade level to the next. That's how we're defining on track. When we get the course data, we'll start talking about credit accumulation. The end of freshman year, have they, have they successfully completed the credits that we would think would lead them into sophomore year? So we'll be able to enhance this report with better data. But how about the students that transferred out that we thought were going to another public school system in the state? That's the transferred out unverified column. Those are our meltaways. Those are students that, for some reason, never went to where they might have told a staff member that they were going. And that is part of the new NCLB accountability for graduation rate. We are accountable for those students now. Okay? All right, so I'm going to now yield to my colleague, Pete. I thank you very much again for having me. Good morning, everyone. If, uh, if my clock is correct, I think my time expired about a minute ago. <laughs> so uh, I want to make sure we have some time for questions, and I want to make sure you get your break. So I'm not going to spend too much time going through a deck. I don't enjoy talking at folks at all. So hopefully we'll have some more time for a little dialogue. Of course, you get your break. Um, about a year and a half ago, I was in Dover, Delaware, uh, completing the second round, probably in a, in a room like this, about half the size, same number of windows, though. So. Um, in the second round of a, a grueling RFP process. Delaware was one of those states, uh, one race at the top. We had not 76, but 42 different initiatives going on. And we put out an RFP for leadership coaching. And um, vendor after vendor coming in with different ideas of, hey, we're going to pull your principles out, fly them to Minneapolis for PD, they'll learn everything you need to know in 72 hours, we'll send them back, and ta-da, the achievement gap will be closed, right? Um, uh, then Dr. Reeves came, and his team with the Leadership and Learning Center outlined the philosophy that was evident in his presentation today. And uh, long story short is we took us no time at all, a sort of uh, consensus, we went ahead, fruitful relationship thus far. My reason for saying this is to say, sort of, not just say that sort of I'm a, I'm a fan of sort of the principles and philosophy of Dr. Reeves, but I actually sort of have lived it in some ways. And I wanted to sort of, sort of impress upon you sort of this military has this term called uh, bluff, bottom line up bluff. So I want to leave you with sort of three pieces here, and I'll, of course, the deck will be accessible to you. Um, first and foremost, the work and philosophy of Dr. Reeves, core principles and goals of NJPSA, and the work of the department around the human capital, the great teachers and leaders, there's a Venn diagram with about a 95% what we're, what we're hearing. We're looking to get away from compliance and into service delivery support. 
we're looking to get away from prescription and learn from the fields of innovation. So that sort of leads me to my, to my second point. Um, I will show one slide here. I love, I love the phrase, can we fire away to Finland, right? Of course we can, right? Um, the evaluation, which might be an impetus for uh, sort of uh, employment decisions, is one piece of a human capital continuum or human capital life cycle. Um, as a uh, story goes, I'll sort of speak to Delaware again, a uh, uh, superintendent I was meeting with, he used to say to me, Pete, you know, now we've raised the top and all this sort of momentum, I'm finally going to fire all of my ineffective teachers, we have a new process, we're going to do it, so on and so forth, and eloquently goes through it for about 20 minutes, I nod my head, and at the end of the conversation, well, who's going to replace them? I have a thought, right? I, I don't know. So it's sort of a simple sort of example of how all these pieces are inextricably linked. So, the third piece I want to sort of impress upon you, when it comes to sort of elements of effective teaching and effective leadership, we know that Trenton doesn't have all the answers. In fact, we know across this country we don't have all the answers. Um, Dr. Reeves mentioned something about sort of the value of learning from error, the value of continuous improvement, the value of learning from innovation. We're looking, so a traditional state agency, policy comes down and ends up, everyone's practice is like that. We're looking to sort of change that continuum and actually have practice in form policy. Um, from what you've seen come out of my office in the last four to five months since I've been on board, and I should have sort of given a little of my history like Barry did, but uh, I figured time didn't permit. So everything and every, anything we're doing is about, at this point on the evaluation, in piloting and learning. We believe there's a learning phase. We believe there's actually a second move or advantage to learn from all of our peer states and districts across this country who have taken some of these missteps. I love the idea of the rear view, and I think we, you've used that a number of times, is that really learning from the rear view. And understanding that across uh, this state, we've got about 600 districts, not all of them are gonna uh, sort of attack this issue in the same manner. And we have to make sure that we have innovation, we have some level of flexibility and entrepreneurial thinking that goes on. At the same time, the balance for us as a state is to have some level of comparability. Because we wanna make sure that sort of effective teaching, effective leadership looks the same in Tenafly as it does in Atlantic City. So that's sort of our role to be able to create by some level of compliance on a small level, but support on a large level to ensure that that happens. So that's sort of three sort of takeaways on this. We have about five minutes. All right, I'll, I'll walk you through because I think that um important to know that the teacher evaluation and even the principal evaluation is consuming a lot of the oxygen across the country in the dialogue, right? And people think that Evaluation is the panacea, and we're going to get evaluation right, and it's going to inform everything else we do, and we're going to be able to separate our ineffective teachers, and maybe merit pay, maybe, and, and I'm not going to understate the importance of good evaluation, but as Dr. Reeves said, evaluation, first and foremost, is only one tool of being an instructional leader. The idea of informal observation, the idea of walkthroughs, the idea of the principle of being in the PLC, these are transformative ideas that have to come from the local level. These are things that we're not looking to mandate at the state level, but there's an expectation upon the principal that this is your job. Being an instructional leader is priority number one. So that being said, just on the recruitment and preparation side, as you go through these slides, um, I spent a little bit of time uh, educating myself more about PSA, about the core principles and, and the work, and having had some extensive time with that. Um, it's unbelievable, as I was putting my slides, to be able to go through and you'll see these <coughs> green bullseyes that I put on them, all the issues that I've taken that are core to our theory of action in the department, which are embedded in sort of the theory of action of PSA. So I don't want to read the slides to you, but I want to let you know that the idea is that when you look recruitment and preparation side, um, again, this is not about evaluation. I think there's a uniform agreement between NJA, PSA, and of course the department that we want to have a pipeline of strong teachers and leaders, and it's making sure to, uh, to make sure that all of our LEAs have the ability to staff their classrooms, to staff vacancies. Um, that's predicated in some way on data, right? I think the, as an example, Teach for America teachers are always heralded as being so good. Well, do we have data showing our Teach for America teachers are out for, our math teachers in TFA are outperforming in Montclair State? Well, at the, at the department, we're going to start collecting that data and really have some informed dialogue about some of these issues. I think, uh, additionally, I would say that uh, we really need to look at our preparation program sort of approval process. What is going into the curriculum and the content that our um, IHEs are using to prepare our teachers and leaders? And 
how does, does or does that not align to elements of the common core of the teacher evaluation? We don't want one area to be steeped in theory, and then when you sort of step into the classroom or step into school, the practice is completely different. Licensure and certification, again, a lot of uh, discussion even nationally about how different certification processes look and in accordance with uh, licensure exams, how relevant are they? How much do they actually correlate or have a causation effect to student outcomes? And if they don't, well, we have to modify them. That's sort of our role at the state to really learn and research what's going on nationally. I think that um, as you think about our three-tiered certification system, is it working for us? And this is a dialogue we're looking to have with NJPSA and NJEA to really think about this because I, I think our interests are absolutely aligned. I don't want to get too into the evaluation. I think we could talk about it for uh, forever. I think the idea is that as, uh, and I, I, I see a lot of familiar faces in this audience, so I probably talk to a number of you in different venues in, in some manner, but I think the idea on the teacher side is the widget effect, which is the 2009 report, really did a, a, a significant job in, in showing that our current evaluation systems are not meeting the needs of principals, nor are they meeting the needs of our teaching staff. So the idea is that I don't want to say that we have broken systems. In fact, across the state, we have some very good areas to sort of uh, celebrate and, 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 and build upon. But universally across this uh, country, I think the fair word is that we can improve upon our current systems. I think most of you know this already, but I'll just uh, be a little, just put it out there. We, uh, in 1011, we had a educator effective task force separate and apart from the department that put forth what they felt were recommendations for a robust teacher and principal evaluation systems. These recommendations have led to uh, some level of foundation for pilot initiatives, which we started both in 1112 and will be continuing in 1213 at both the teacher and now the principal level. The principal pilot program will be released in, I think, three to four weeks from now, and we encourage districts to apply who, who feel that they are sort of ready, willing, and able sort of to, uh, to accept this, this sort of endeavor. Again, these pilots are for learning, and that's, that's, that, that can't be restated enough. Professional development, uh, a term that we could spend uh, you know, another few hours discussing, but I think that Dr. Reeves and, and, and Penny really touched upon the, 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 the important points about just the alignment of professional development, the feedback, and the follow-up. Um, PSA had a, a great piece in the uh, Connected Action Roadmap, which I know I have to thank Pat for, and talking about just the importance of developing a strategic plan that integrates the development of PLCs with curriculum assessment and shared leadership. A PLC to sit around and talk about sort of how the, uh, the Giants or the Jets are doing doesn't help anyone, right? So, and we've all seen it, so just to uh, just keep going. The last piece, and, and again, it's, uh, it's one that's uh, uh, inflammatory in some ways is to talk about sort of the uh, both <coughs> retention and separation issues. We know that nationally 50% of all our teachers within the first three years leave, 50% of all our attrition happens within teachers in the first five years, right? These are startling, just startling numbers in general. How, how do we move away from that? I don't think the answer is simple. I think it's a multifaceted approach. I think separation has to be part of the conversation, but unfortunately it's the, uh, it's the headline, headline that that sort of, uh, sort of dictates most of the media out there. The truth is an evaluation system, as we all know, is about professional growth. <coughs> and that is the, the, the foremost reason. The secondary and tertiary reasons are to inform some personnel decisions. Concurrently, we have to look at how to retain the best. We all know, and Dr. Reed sort of uh, pointed to a study, money's not the answer, right? Money doesn't work. That's what not what intrinsically or extrinsically motivates people. There's been studies and organizations uh, you know, from, you know, from the outside of education that's proven this time and time again. So I think the, the, the conversation, again, has to think about sort of the confluence of factors that we can use to retain individuals and how we look at what a 30-year teaching career has been as well as the, what sort of Generation Y and the Millennials and the Digital Natives are looking forward in their careers and how do we make sure we shape the industry appropriately. So that's just a, a, a quick overview and these slides are for you. I want to make sure we have a couple minutes for questions. Probably pass over to Pat. I, I just want to say one thing that's worth mentioning, and I'll take the liberty of speaking on behalf of, of Barry and Penny. Uh, the, the compliment that, that Pat paid us initially, I'd like to pay her back. She has been just an absolute valued partner since the day I have arrived and to speak to. And the ideas coming out of PSA have been ones that we can take with heart. We think they're fair, we think they're honest, we think they have a tremendous amount of merit. In fact, Pat and I will be collaborating as a, uh, as a statewide team for the CCSSO, State Educator Effectiveness, and I think it's so important that we work together on these issues. Thank you.
Thanks so much. Again, I want to thank the panel and um, just say that, you know, the, the CAR model that you referred to, you know, talks about conversations that leaders and teachers have to have within schools to get set this kind of process in motion for true school improvement. But the conversation, I am so excited because the, the con this really is a conversation. I do have to say to you that, that the department has been so open to having these conversations and the fact that they said in their waiver that NJPSA um, will partner with them on the professional development for, uh, for our school leaders is, is just outstanding. Um, that we're counting on each other to get us through to meet the challenges that this school reform um, will certainly put in front of us. So um, again, I thank all of you. And now we do have time, and I want to, I'm just going to extend the time, you know, about 10 minutes for questions, and then we'll take a short break. Uh, before we continue the conference. So I'm sure there are a lot of questions. And if you will go to the mic, um, that will be helpful. Thank you. Hi, how are you? I'm going to speak loudly, I hope. Uh, question for Mr. Shulman. Uh, we're pretty clear in the district in terms of the point of evaluation for uh, for teachers of the tested subjects, we're really unclear about the 70% of teachers who are in the untested. We keep seeing district uh, district decision making, and people keep asking me, "Well, how are you going to evaluate your gym teacher? How are you going to evaluate your your child's tech team member?" So, can you give us any clarity where that's going, and when can we expect some clarity regarding that issue? Thank you. I just ask for one second. I wanted to get your name. I'm sorry, I missed your name. Uh, Dr. Anderson, Schools. Great question. Thank you for asking. Um, so, short answer is no one across the country has all these answers, right? There aren't standardized tests for welding, gym teachers, journalism teachers, social studies in the high school. It's just not, it's not, it's not, it's not out there. So, what we're looking to do, and you'll see this evident in our, uh, in the recent pilot that we've sort of put out, is we're looking to dial down the percentage for, and, and let me make sure we're, we're talking about, when we talk about evaluation, there's multiple components of the evaluation. We're here specifically talking about the student outcome side, right? So we're forgetting for a second the teacher practice side, which is in fact the more important side of the puzzle. Um, on the student outcome side, these non-tested grades and subject areas, what we're looking to do is to dial down the percentage of the overall weight of these components when it comes to terms of the evaluation in and of itself. So in the pilot that we've just released for non-testing grades and subject areas, this percentage can be dialed down to as low as 10%. The reason we want it to be 10% and the reason we want something, again, for a pilot, for time to learn, is because we think part of the culture change around a evaluation has to move from a teacher-centered evaluation to a student-centered evaluation. The student outcomes are critically important. It's why we all sort of get up in the morning. The, the thinking about this is that there's many ways to do this, and this is where the innovation comes in. There are student learning objectives, there are SMART goals, there's growth and formative assessment. As Dr. Reeves pointed out, is that a standardized assessment that results are given retrospectively, they don't help in a PLC. They don't help about within growth in the school year. We think there's many ways that having, uh, Dr. Reeves mentioned, a 100-day goal, potentially, these are goals that can be measured as part of an evaluation, but more importantly, will help teachers grow. So we're looking for some innovation, innovative solutions from the field. At the same time, we're looking to provide guidance in the up and an upcoming memo as what we think some of, I guess, lessons learned from other states today. But again, great question. Thank you. Dr. Michelle from Senate School District. Um, I want to share an observation. I've had the opportunity to hear you speak before. There's a great distance between what you communicate to the field versus what we read in the paper. Uh, and I just, and I, I think you already know that. And what's moving uh, a lot of the discourse and discussion within our districts and communities is what people are reading in the paper versus people not having the benefit of what we're having. And so you're kind of between a rock and a hard place, I, I think. Uh, but I just wanted to make that share that observation. Uh, <laughs> with that said, uh, there's a couple of things. Uh, one was uh, basically to ask the department to consider uh, when it relates to the graduation rate, uh, we're a former advocate and so on. 
the, the, the issue around graduation and the conversations that's required with the student, with the family, and so, so on, a lot of people have not captured that in terms of what those behaviors look like for schools that are successful in increasing graduation rate or the inverse, reducing the dropout rate. I think the department needs to look at uh, doing some research around that issue. I mean, people are familiar with the causes, but people don't talk about the behaviors that schools can do, along with other partners, social agencies, and so on, that actually does allow for more graduates uh, to occur and fewer dropouts to happen. That's one piece. The other piece is, in terms of the model, model curriculum, I would suggest that the department, in terms of the video library and the on-track, that they, they come to some, again, research to find out, okay, these model lessons have, been, have not yet been tested against these outcomes. We're, we're presenting them as model lessons, but we don't know if these, these lessons actually resulted in the type of learning that we assume that they did. So if there's some way that the department could look and say, okay, let's, video, let's have the video tape, let's look at these lessons, and then let's look at them in relationship to the results, since we're all trying to be results oriented, and work backwards from that. Because a lot of teachers will look at these model uh, um, curriculum documents and these video library and assume that these are presented as issues that have been tested against the common core. And the last piece is, I've, I've had the benefit of working with K-4 teachers and one of the things that we did was in our district was, uh, in Salem was, we asked teachers, how many of you have had reading courses or literacy courses in undergrad? And the maximum uh, number of courses that any one of our teachers had was two. And I, I don't think that's unique to say. Uh, and one of the other things that came out of that conversation, when we shared the exemplar text that came out, and we said we're going to purchase them, we're going to utilize them, many of these titles are not familiar to teachers. So that's something in terms of implementation of the Common Core that we may want to think about and say, look, we have an exemplar text. How do we want to use this really important set of list of literary works that um, we want to see in classrooms and use. So I know I put a lot on the table, but just a thing. So I'm just going to be very quick about, about grad rate, because it's, it's such an important thing. Um, the best and the most accessible research that I've seen about this comes from Johns Hopkins. I don't know if you've been paying attention to it. It's very straightforward. ABC, attendance, behaviors, credits, right? And so you, you look at those things, and we can start modeling them very early, right? We can start modeling attendance at first grade. We can start modeling the, the on grade level reading in third grade. We can bring all of these things together. The, the, the thing that we've missed is the dependent variable, which is who graduates in four years from high school. Because we needed four years of data inside NJ Smart to be able to, to go backwards and say, of the kids who graduate within four years, this is what they looked like along the way. And we can now do that. By the way, we backloaded uh, assessment data into NJSmart back to 1999. So you have your high school students who have their third grade assessments loaded into NJSmart. So we're building, again, the one-click functionality. That is, these are the kids who are not on track to be ready for college and career. We're going to be building that functionality inside NJSmart using the data at hand. And, but we have rough measures, right? What is a student that's illustrating college-ready behaviors outside of the academics, right? What are the kids, what are they looking like, right? So states have been, you know, are they filling out the financial aid form? Right? A lot of states are co collecting that data. We're trying to stay away from those kinds of things. But you have behaviors that you know. Are they coming in? Are they, do they have a plan? What's, what are those sorts of things? So we're gonna be, you're going to be able to marry that data together with the outcome data. Um, we, we also, I'm going to give Penny the microphone so she can address the rest of your questions, but, you know, college readiness test scores. Right now, loaded inside NJ Smart, all the SAT data. Maybe you didn't, weren't, weren't aware of that. We take the data from the college board, we load it in at a, at a student level. You can look at who, in 12th grade, has not taken an SAT. 